morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service at the St. Peter's Church of Christ. We appreciate everyone's attendance. In a moment, we'll have our scripture reading. Dan will be reading that for us. I'll be leading our singing. Opening prayer will be Joe Leibner. Closing prayer will be Jim Gilstrap. Jamie is handing, handling our AV booth. And Fred and Dan will be leading our Lord's Supper at the appropriate time. I have just a few announcements. Uh, at this time, we'd like to extend our sympathy to the fam family of Mamie Craig. She passed away uh, this week on Friday, January 22nd. She had recently just had her 96th birthday, and she was a longtime member at the Charbon and Karen and St. Peter's Churches of Christ. And, and our pr uh, prayer list uh, is very long this week. Uh, please take a look at that. We have uh, some special requests. Peter Gallagher, who is Michelle's brother-in-law, was recently diagnosed with early stage ALS. And Jerry Lynn, who is Michelle's sister, uh, tore her meniscus and ACL and will be having surgery on her knee uh, next Wednesday. Uh, other than that, please take a look at the uh, prayer list in the bulletin. Uh, that's all the announcements that I have this time. We'll begin our worship service with our scripture reading. Again, that scripture reading is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15 through 18. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We'll begin our worship with We Praise Thee, O God. Let us sing.
song before our opening prayer is Faith is the Victory. Let us sing. Please follow along in prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, how truly grateful we are for another few moments of life here upon this earth. We're so thankful for the creation which you have made for us to abide in. We're so thankful for all of the comforts and the needs which it provides for us. Father, we're thankful for each and every moment of life that you give us here upon this earth that we might have an opportunity to live in the way that is in accordance with your will. And we pray, Father, that you continue to help us to redeem the time, that we continue to uh, look forward to our goal, that we are not uh, wasting the time which we've been allotted, but that we are using it for your service and for uh, the glory of the gospel. Father, we pray that you be with the needs of those that were mentioned this morning. As it's fitting with your will, we pray that you provide for them, help them to face the challenges that that are before them with endurance, help them to turn to you for their needs. Father, where it is uh, fitting with your will, we pray for um, an increase in their, in their health and uh, a decrease in their troubles. Father, we're so thankful for this congregation of your people and we pray that you continue to bless it as you already have. We're so thankful for our elders here that oversee this work and we pray that you bless them and their families. Help each of us as we continue to strive to work here, uh, to be willing to be um, led by these men. Help us to continually um, make sure that the things that we are doing here are done in a way uh, as outlined in the scripture. Help us, Father, to always seek authority there first. Father, we pray that as we go throughout the remainder of our service here this morning, that you be with each and every one of us. We're so thankful for our brother John and his willingness and ability to lead our songs. And as we uh, go.
go through our songs this morning. Help us not to just uh, um, to just sing along with them, but help us to evaluate the things that are being said. Help us to uh, check them for accuracy against the scripture. And help us, Father, to reflect on those messages within our own lives. As we go through our um, sermon period this morning, help us to, uh, again, check the things that are being said against the scripture, to meditate upon the word, to actively listen, and to make applications so that we might uh, leave here with an opportunity to apply those things out in the, out in the world away from uh, this congregation. Help us to diligently listen to the prayers that are being said. Help us to think about those things. And as we go through the Lord's Supper, and as we go through the uh, opportunity that we have to give, help us to uh, remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf, and help us to be grateful and joyous in our giving. All these things we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. song of invitation will be, What Shall It Be? The song before our lesson will be, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. If you can do so, let us stand as we sing.
Thank you, John. In the book of First Thessalonians, we have been looking at this book in some previous lessons as we will continue to do so. Because in this letter, it's a letter of thankfulness that Paul is writing to these brethren. He is so thankful for their trust that they have been demonstrating in the sense of doing what God was demanding them to do. And whenever Paul thought about these brethren, it brought about certainly great joy in his heart, in his life, as he would remember <coughs> their labor, their work, uh, the example that they were setting before others. And he was so thankful for these brethren. Toward the end of this letter, as we notice it as being 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you notice in that chapter, in verses 1 through 11, it's talking about a certain day that is coming. And in our previous lessons, we have spent some time looking at that day. The day of the great Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, in this letter, as he speaks to that day, he's doing so to motivate them, to encourage them, to keep up, to continue on doing what they are doing that brings honor and glory to God. Then verses 12 through 15, Paul reminds them of some duty that they have toward each other. Talks about those that are over them talks about the elders, talks about brethren, and he talks about all people. And so as he closes this letter, he wants to spend time now, when he talks about the day of the Lord here, he's not really telling them anything new. Because the time that he had previously spent with them, even though it was limited, Paul had taught them several things about the day of the Lord. And so these words here in chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, is simply reminding them of many of the things he had already taught them about that day. But also he wanted to remind them that they have responsibility toward others. He talks about their duty that they have toward others. And so he's reminding them that, that you're not just living here for yourself. You are to be considering others. You are to be thinking about others and what you can do to help them, what you can do to assist them what you can do to make things better for them. And so life is not centering upon oneself, but it also involves that of service, certainly to others, and certainly doing things to support others in that which is good and right. But also that would involve doing or saying things to others that you see are not doing things that they should be doing, or they're doing things that will harm them spiritually. And therefore, he reminds them to 
certainly to be warning others when that warning is needed. There are some that are, in a sense, feeble-minded. There are some that will become discouraged from time to time. And so Paul is reminding them that look out for them. And not just look out for them, but desire to do something to help them to be better. And in verse 15 of that section, we have a phrase in there that I want to focus upon this morning. Notice in verse 15, in the King James, he says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. It, it, it doesn't matter who the individual is, whether it be brethren or not, whether it be a child of God or not. Revenge, retaliation, is not to be a part of your life. And if someone speaks evil about you or someone does evil to you, do not respond in like manner. But Paul says here, it's what you are to do. But ever follow that which is good. Yes, among yourselves, among the brethren, but also even to all. There is nowhere in Scripture that you can read, you can study, That God is saying to us that there is some time in your life that you can demonstrate evil toward others. There is some time in your life that you can show some evil toward others. There is some time in your life that you can speak evil toward others. Now you can search it from the beginning of Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation and you will not find that. It is always the case that we, certainly as God's people, we are to always Forever follow that which is good. There is no place in our words for evil speaking. There is no place in our life for evil to be practiced for evil to be brought upon others is not found in Scripture. And so Paul says here, and here is this precept that Paul is laying down. Here is what is to be in your life. Here is what you are to follow after in your life. Now here's the third point, and we'll be going to spend some time looking at this. Verses 16 through 21.
Paul is giving them directions. When you talk about directions, I'm talking about instructions. He's giving them commands. But he's giving them directions here for good in their life. And if you want to know what it means to follow after that which is good and to forever do that, it is easily understood. Now, it may not be, in every case, easily put into practice. And that is the way it is with, with some of the things that God demands us to do. Because, you see, we allow ourselves sometimes to get in the way. Oh, we know what God says in His Word. But then, here's me. Sometimes, I may want to do something a little bit different. I, I, I want to express my feelings to others in a little bit different way than what God says for me to do. I, I, I want to say something in a little bit different way than what God says in reference to how I ought to speak. To others. So sometimes I get in the way of myself following that which is good. You may not have that problem, you may not have any thoughts about that. It may be that, that whatever God demands, I mean, you're on it. There is no hesitation. We ought to realize sometimes our worst enemy in following that which is good is ourselves. You know, sometimes when things are not going the way in which we think we ought to be going, instead of honestly looking at ourselves and saying, okay, I see why. I've just taken a look in the mirror. That's the problem. But you see, when we do that, that doesn't make us feel good. And we want to be feeling good. And so what we do then, instead of taking responsibility, accepting that, Good is not in my life as it ought to be because of me. We want to start. Whoop, there's the one. I try not to point at anybody. There's the one. There's the one. And we never get back here. And so basically, we destroy ourselves. But you see, we feel better blaming others. Here's what they said. Here's what they did. We do understand, do we not? 
that we cannot control what anyone else says or what anyone else does, but I can, and not only can I, God wants me to control what I say, what I do. And as you look at these matters that we'll be looking at this morning, it is, it is clearly demonstrated that here's something that I can do. Here's something that you can do. And may I also point this out? It's not something that I can do. It's not necessarily something that I may do or what you can do or what I can do. It's a matter of what I must. Notice that word? Must. M-U-S-T. And when you begin reading here in verse 16, where Paul is giving directions to the brethren in reference to their following after that which is good. And if you're going to ever follow that which is good, here is something that you must do. It's really not a choice. Oh, I know you can choose to do it and not do it, but I'm saying it's not really a choice if you're going to follow ever that which is good. And so in these verses, verse 16 through verse 22, we want to be noticing three things in reference to these develop number two there are things that we must discontinue and number three there are things that we must discern the that which is to be developed it's found in verse 16 through verse 18. That which we are to discontinue is found in verse 19 through 20. That which is to be discerned is found in verse 21 and 22. Remember, we are to follow ever, ever follow that which is good. How do I do that? How do you do that? Many times we have read these verses. These are verses that I'm sure are very, that you are very familiar with. And Paul says, rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Hold fast that which is good. Abhor that which is evil. Go back before hold fast. He says, prove all things. Verse 21. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And in verse 22, he says to abstain from all appearance 
of evil. If I were to ask you, as a child of God, when you remind others about what they need to do to be saved, as you talk about, yes, hearing of the word, we understand the importance of that, Romans 10 and 17. You were talking about belief, developing faith, And the importance of that. But then let me stop you right there. Would you say anything to that individual or to those people about the need to repent of their sins? Would you say, according to the Scripture? That a person must repent of their sins. And I know what your response would be. Yes. There is no one that can please God without repenting of sins. Then I ask you, why would you say that? Why would we stress repenting of sin, why would we distress, why would we emphasize confessing of Jesus Christ as being the Christ, the Son of God? Why would we emphasize to individual that in order to be saved, that you must be baptized? Why would you do that? And your response would be, that's what the Lord commands. I think sometimes we find it very easy to point out to others what they must do to please God. But then when we look at some of the things in Scripture that are applicable to a child of God, we sometimes look at that and say, oh yeah, I know what it says, but you know, That's not as important. Excuse me. Where did we get our authority to step in and say to God, I know what you have commanded of those who have not been obedient to the gospel, and we're going to declare that. And I also know what you demand of us as a child of God, but we're going to sometimes push that aside. We don't be emphasizing that so much. When you look at the things that Paul is emphasizing in this passage, there is just as much authority behind these things for the saint of God as it is for hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized for the sinner. And when Paul states or writes these things to the brethren, it is in the form of an imperative Here is something that is necessary. Not only is it in that form of something being commanded of them, it is in the tense of that which is to continue. These are not one-time actions And we're done with them. And we need to see that. How often am I to be baptized? 
for the remission of my sins. You know the answer to that. I am to be scripturally baptized once. And if I have been scripturally baptized once, then that's the only time that God demands of me to be baptized. That is not a continual action. And here in this section, verse 16 through verse 22, these are things being demanded of us. And they are to be done continually. It is to be a practice. This is not a one-time thing. It is not a one-day thing. It is not a one-week thing or one-month or one-year thing. Okay, last year I spent all my time praying to God because all the difficult things were happening, so I can back up on that a little bit now. Really? Paul says we are to follow ever after that which is good. When am I to cease following that which is good? You got an answer to that? Is that Monday through Saturday? Is that the answer? Uh, that's the answer some would give. But I'm confident that you would not give that answer. When can we stop following that which is good? The very moment that I can stop following that which is good, that's the very moment that I will stop being a faithful follower of the Lord. Now, tell me when I can stop following that which is good. As we look at these things, this evening, I encourage you this afternoon to go back and read through this section. And we're going to be talking about some attitudes, certainly that need to be developed. We're going to be talking about some things that we are not to do. And we're going to talk about the importance of making sure that that which is good, that we're following that, but then how do we determine that? How do we discern what is good and what is not? Because remember, we're to follow that which is good. And so if we are to follow that which is good, and that is a command of us to do that, then we have to understand what is good. How do we determine that? Do I determine that for myself? Do you determine that for yourself? Is there any standard that we have to go by? And the answer to that is yes, there is the standard, not just A, but there is the standard that we are to go by. Follow ever that which is good. Involves rejoicing, involves remembering God in prayer, involves reflecting upon what God has done for us.
And so there is the attitude. Not of gloom. But the attitude of gladness. There is this attitude that we have to develop that we're going to give in to and go to God in prayer. When? There's the attitude of gratitude in verse 18. And therefore, what do we do if we have developed that attitude? What do we do in every thing? Give thanks. That is not going to happen unless we have developed the attitude of gratitude. And so there is this gladness that has been developed. Listen, we have a choice in these things. These things do not just happen. We choose to either be glad or we choose to be gloomy. That's a choice. And it does not have anything to do with what is happening around us. I can rejoice. I can remember God in prayer. I can reflect upon His blessing. That's something I can do. And when I do that, what am I doing? I'm following that which is good. My life is going to be a lot better. And therefore, in my life, because I'm following that which is good, it's going to be better. That means the people that I come in contact with can be better as well. But it's a choice that I make. Life is not about the circumstances that we face. It is not about the conditions of the world around us. Life is not what comes to us. Life is what we become. When we choose to be what God demands of us. This morning, John is about to lead us in this song, a song of encouragement. If you're here this morning, you have not yet obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to be a child of God. You need to get things right with God. Your sins need to be forgiven. And as we've already emphasized, what is demanded in, along that line, as we have faith and repenting of our sins, we're confessing Christ and we're bound to being baptized for the mission of our sins. Yes, those are choices I have made in my life. Decisions I have made. But when that happens, I can begin to follow that which is good. And as I began to do that, as we've just all touched on this morning, there are some things that God demands of us. Directions He has given in His Word that we need to follow if we're going to follow that which is good.
If you have not obeyed the gospel, we encourage you this morning to come and render obedience to his will. If you need to come with the child of God because of sin in your life. Well, there are other things happening in your life that's having an effect upon your thinking, your mindset. And it's not where it should be. Because we know what happens if our thinking is not right, if our mindset is not where it should be. That means our words. That means our way of life will not be what it should be. We encourage you to come. We're together. We stand. And as we sing. To prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing In the Hour of Trial.
bow with me. Most loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time that we could get around this table and partake of these emblems that was inst instituted by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, at this time, as we partake of this bread, which to us as Christians is Christ's body, let us do so in a manner well pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to partake of this cup, this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood that was shed on the cross. Lord, as we partake of it, we pray that we will remember that sacrifice that he made for us. We pray that we will look forward to his second coming and that we will examine ourselves as we partake of it. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. the Lord's Supper concluded as we are commanded to do one other thing, which is to give. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the, all the blessings of this life and the talents you have given us to go out and support ourselves and to be able to get the things we need to help us do this life here on earth. Heavenly Father, at this time as we give back, that we'll do so with a glad, cheerful heart. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We appreciate everyone's attendance here this morning. Uh, please remember our Sunday evening worship service at 5 o'clock and our midweek Bible study at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. In closing, we're going to sing, My Name is in the Book of Life. After the song, Brother, Brother Jim will lead us in our closing prayer. If we can do so, let us stand as we sing. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, 
We are truly thankful for this body of your people, these children of yours. There's so many great examples here of what it is to be a Christian. There's so many people that do what you have commanded us and show great resolve in, in helping others, doing things for others, and being thankful to you. We thank you, Lord God, for the encouragement we receive from them. And we thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity we have to worship like this. We had a period of time this last year where we couldn't assemble together. And I came to understand just how great a gift that is and the opportunity we have to be together with other brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you this morning for many things, O oh Lord. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for your love and strength. We thank you for our families. We thank you for this country. We thank you, Lord God, that we can come together like this, be of one mind and one faith. We pray, O oh Lord God, that we'll also be a confident people, people who know that their name is in the book of life and do all we can to make sure it is not taken out. We thank you for your word because it allows us to develop that confidence, to understand what it takes to be saved, and to be able to do your will. In order to do your will, we have to understand it. And we thank you for the studies we do, for the lessons we receive, the, the preaching that we receive. It allows us to become more knowledgeable and more confident. We pray for many in our prayer list, certainly. We think of... Uh, the family of Mamie Crape at this time, with the loss of her. We think of uh, Penny and Becky and so many others that need our, our prayers. We pray that you're with them and watching over them, keeping them in your care. For those that are recovering from illnesses, we pray that, that they continue to heal and get stronger. For those who are yet to face surgeries and, uh, and, and get, yet to be treated for some of the things they have, we pray you're with them and with those that, that uh, minister to them. Help us each day, O oh Lord, to be thankful for all the blessings you give us, to be thankful for the opportunities we have to teach others and share with them our, our faith and our concern for their souls. Be with us as we depart and help us to return tonight together again, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.